All right, welcome to today's free prep hour, everyone. I'm Tyler Johnson. I am an instructor at Manhattan Prep. And just like all the other instructors here, uh, I'm a 99th percentile score on the test that I teach, which is the GRE. And like every other instructor, I'm a big nerd. And that's why I'm here to talk about this stuff, because I enjoy geeking out about this kind of stuff. Uh, and hopefully you enjoy the next hour with me as well. Um, right now, this is being recorded live in a Zoom room. You might be watching it on YouTube after the fact, but if you're here with me in the Zoom room right now, go ahead in the chat box. Tell me what city you are connecting from. Uh, I myself, I'm in San Francisco, California right now, but I just want to get a sense of where else in the world y'all are watching or connecting from right now. All right, New York. I I used to live in Brooklyn. I just moved to the West Coast about a month ago. Nairobi, Kenya. It's a ways away from from the states. All right, cool. Well, wherever you are, welcome. Uh, the subject of today's prep hour is going to be all about area. So we're taking a deep dive on geometry today. Hope you enjoy that title. It's got some nice alliteration going on. I wrote it myself. And to get things rolling, I'm just going to toss you all into the deep end and start things off with a problem. So go ahead and check this one out. I'll give you a couple minutes to solve it. And when you have the answer, chat it to me. So one of the more common traps I see on GRE parallelogram questions is a bit of extraneous information because we have this length of 10, this width of five, and this, I'll call it a height cutting through the shape of three. But we actually don't need that five at all because for a parallelogram, the area is just base times height. So I take that base of 10, multiply it by my height of 3, and the correct answer is 30. And if you're not sure on why a parallelogram area is base times height, you're probably more familiar with a triangle. So if I split the shape into two triangles, 
remember that a triangle area is one half base times height. And a parallelogram is just two triangles put together. So it's a half base times height with another half base times height that gives you the full base times height for a parallelogram. But now I want to take the same shape. And if I change what we're asking for, chat me the answer to this new problem. What would be the length of y? So what's going on here is that we have a base and a height, 10 times 3. But we also have a second base and height here. We could be treating 5 as a base and y as a height. And because those are on the same parallelogram, the two areas from those two calculations must be equal to one another. In other words, the 30 from the 10 times 3 must be equal to the 5y of 5 times y. So in this case, y would have to be 6. And what's tricky about this is naturally when we look at a shape, we want to treat the bottom as the base. right? If I show you this triangle right now, your eyes are probably jumping to that bottom side as the base of the triangle, which isn't wrong. You can certainly treat it that way. But on a tricky test like this, you have to be open to the possibility that any side of the figure could be the base. I can make that left leg be my base, in which case the height is going to cut through the shape at an angle. I could have that right side be the base. Again, that's going to reorient my height. But any one of these interpretations is a legal way to treat the base and the height of a triangle. And with that, I want to define the height a little bit more. There's two things that have to be true to get a height, whether it's of a parallelogram or a triangle. One, it must be perpendicular to whatever side you're treating as the base. And two, it needs to connect to what I'll call the opposite side or vertex. That is, it needs to cut all the way across the shape. And in some triangles, if I were to draw a triangle that looked 
like this, where I have an obtuse angle, what that means for this shape, if I treat that bottom side as my base, in order to get a height that's perpendicular, the height would actually fall slightly outside the triangle itself, which is a little weird, but that's how you get that perpendicularity, if that's a word. <laughs> but when you have an obtuse triangle, the height can lie outside the shape. And another really common thing is if you have a right triangle, that kind of already has the base and height built into it, right? If I treat that bottom side as my base, then the height is the other leg right there. And in terms of area, anytime you're making an area calculation, it comes down to that perpendicular term that you need to multiply, right? There's always going to be some base and then some height that runs perpendicular to it. That's how you're creating area, you're creating space when you multiply. So for the parallelogram, as we've seen, it's always base times height. For a triangle, it's 1 half the base times the height. Making sure that's perpendicular. And then for the trapezoid down here in the bottom left, there's this kind of long-winded formula, 1 half b1 plus b2 times height. The way I find that easier to remember, the whole 1 half b1 plus b2 thing, just think of that as the average of the bases. It's base 1 plus b2 divided by 2, the average. So in this case, you're kind of considering both bases. But again, you got to be multiplying by a perpendicular height. And even when it comes to the circle, you're multiplying by the radius squared. And I like to think of that as you know, two kind of perpendicular oriented radii like that. And then you additionally have to multiply by pi to account for uh, the curvature of the circle. Otherwise, you would just get a square area. And 3D shapes tend to be pretty rare on the GRE, but we can take the same logic and apply it to the third dimension as well. So if we're talking about volume, we take the area you get by multiplying a base and a height, and then you expand that in three dimensions by multiplying by the depth. So if you had a rectangular prism, it's the base times the height of that shaded face, and then you multiply it by that third depth dimension. And it wouldn't matter if we had a parallelogram or a trapezoid, you would always find the area of that face and then multiply by the depth. So for a triangular prism, it's 1 half base times height, the area of that face, again, multiplied by the depth. Or finally, the cylinder, find the area of that circular face, pi r squared, and then multiply by the depth of that shape. Okay, and if we can walk it back to 2D shapes for a moment, I've got another question I want to show you all. This one's going to be a quantitative comparison. And in case you're unfamiliar with the answers to quantitative comparisons on the GRE, choice A means that quantity A is greater than quantity B. Choice B is that quantity A is less than. Choice C is that the two quantities are equal. And choice D is, I'll say it this way, you can't get a consistent relationship. One or more of the above is possible.
So if you're familiar with quantitative comparisons, when you're dealing with an algebraic quantitative comparison with variables, one of the effective strategies there is to pick values for the variables. And for a geometric quantitative comparison like this, a similar approach is to try and pick different shapes that could be represented by the diagram. Because GRE diagrams, you want to take them with a grain of salt. They're often very deceiving. And you can tell this one's definitely not drawn to scale. If that base is 11 and that height is 3, things are definitely not in proportion here. So I try and take the shape that's displayed and kind of bend it into various possible shapes that don't break the rule. So I can't change the 11, I can't change the three, but there's lots of other unknowns about this to have some flexibility. And I wanna try and imagine the different possibilities there. And one possibility would be if I really condense this shape down and make that AB base at the top really, really small. I can't make it be like exactly zero because then it would be a triangle, but imagine it was just slightly above zero, just like a fraction of a value, something like that. It would still be a trapezoid. Definitely that bottom base is way bigger than the top, but still qualifies as a trapezoid. And what we would find there is remember that our trapezoid area, it's our average of the bases times height. So here, if it's 11 plus essentially nothing, I take the average of those two values, and then we're multiplying by our height of 3, I would get 5 and a half times 3, which is 16.5. So if I squash AB down as far as it could go, I still end up with an area bigger than quantity B. So no matter what, quantity A is always going to be the bigger value. Because at minimum, it's 16 and a half. Okay, let's try a multiple choice question next. I'll give you all about three minutes with this one.
Okay, let's take a look at this one. So because this is a rectangle, AD is going to be equal to BE plus EC. In other words, if I call that 2x down there, you know, BE plus EC also equals 2x. And if I wanted to, I might be able to label BE and EC x themselves, but I want to be careful with that because this figure is not drawn to scale. I don't necessarily know if E is right in the middle of the shape quite yet. But another thing that would be safe here is to recognize ABE and ECD. I can call both those right triangles. So they have the same height. And for this inner triangle in the middle, AED, because it's a rectangle, that must also have the same height. So I'm going to change the variables a little bit. But if I called this A and B and C as those blue lengths, and we just use the generic H for each of those heights, we can see the area of the two smaller triangles is going to combine to the same as the area of that inner triangle. So the answer is going to be A. And if you want a more algebraic solution there, just use those variables. So you have 1 half A times height. Plus 1 half, or not plus, but it's equal to 1 half the B times height and 1 half C times height. And because A equals B plus C, you can factor that 1 half H out of both those terms on the right. And you see it's all equal to that bottom base. Let me know if there's any questions on this one. This next one's pretty similar. We're going to change the way this shape is originally presented and make it a little more lopsided. So try out this variant.
A piece of advice I give in a lot of geometry problems is to look for the hidden triangles. Like if you're stuck on a shape, see if you can divide it and pull out some other triangles inside of it. And if you know ABE has an area of six, I'm really just going to draw another equal triangle right next to it. Right, I've got this rectangle that I can divide into two triangles, both of area six. Same thing, if triangle ECD is 26, if I make that a rectangle, then there's a, an equivalent triangle adjacent to it that also has area 26. So one blue and one green makes 32, another blue and another green, 32 plus 32 means the area of the entire rectangle is C64. Let's do another quantitative comparison next. Try this one. Here, if point E is the midpoint, then you know AE and ED are going to be equal. And I'm looking at those triangles on the upper right of the figure. So if I call each of those B for a base, those are both equal. So now I need to think about the height. So if I start with that upper triangle AEB, it's an obtuse triangle. So in order to get my height perpendicular to the base, it would need to fall a little bit outside the triangle. So something like that. 
and that would be the height for AEB. But also, if I look at the triangle on the right, BED, you're going to have the same exact height for that one. So these triangles have the same base. They have the same height. That means their areas are going to be equal. And the answer is C. Let's try one more of these quantitative comparisons next. So remember to look for those hidden triangles. I'm going to add a couple lines here. And at this point, you should notice that area in green, that's symmetrical in both these figures. Same exact dimensions, same exact location. And that shape on the right, What we've done is just kind of flip that one upside down, but it has the same area. Or for more conclusive proof, think about the heights of these triangles. If that blue side is the base, the base is five units long in each figure, and the height is going to be two units there, two units there, two units there, two units there. It's the same triangle four times. So everything here is equal, and C is the answer. So you see a weird shape? Do what you can to break it down into more digestible triangles. C 
see if you can take that idea and apply it here. So this one's pretty tricky. 
but there's a couple shortcuts we could use here. First thing, you might want to split that up into a bunch of smaller triangles. All right, we can take that hexagon, split it into six equilateral triangles. And if we look closer at one of these equilateral triangles, you'll notice that within it, you can create a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Right? If you split one of those 60 degree angles right down the middle, it becomes a 30, 60, 90. And the proportions of any 30, 60, 90 triangle are going to be x for the shortest side, x root 3 for the longer leg, and then 2x for the hypotenuse. So you know if that hypotenuse is 4, that shorter side would be 2. And the height, that longer leg in this case, would be 2 root 3, which means the area of one of those triangles will be 4 root 3. Now, if I have 6 of those equilateral triangles, just multiply that by 6, and you get choice D. And one shortcut you could use here, if you're going for a really high quant score, you'll want to know the equilateral triangle area formula, which is side squared times the square root of 3 divided by 4. So as soon as you realize it's an equilateral triangle with a side of 4, you're going to square that 4 into 16, multiply it by root 3, and divide by 4. And it's a quicker way to arrive at 4 root 3. And then you scale that up for the six triangles in the shape. And you again get answer D. OK, we talked a lot about triangles. Let's move into some quadrilaterals next. Try this one.
There's a couple ways to solve this one. I'll start with kind of the longer, more algebraic route before I show you a shortcut here. So the figure on the right, that's a rectangle. So 2y and y are the dimensions. So its total perimeter is going to be 6y. And if square s has the same perimeter, its side lengths would have to be 3y over 2. So in terms of area for quantity a, it's going to be 2y times y, which is 2y squared. And for the square, we're going to have 3y over 2 squared, which is 9y squared divided by 4. And you'll notice if I had 8 over 4, that would be exactly 2y squared. But I have a little more in my numerator. So quantity b must be the bigger value. So that's kind of the crunchy algebraic way you can prove quantity b is bigger. But I can look at this one and solve it in 30 seconds just by using logic. Because I know that if I have a rectangle and a square, right? And this rectangle is itself not a square. The square is always going to have the larger area. How do I know that? <laughs> well, allow me to demonstrate. If you want to think purely about quadrilaterals for a moment, imagine we had these three variants on a quadrilateral. Like in the previous problem, every shape here has the same perimeter. Which one of these shapes would have the largest area and which one would have the smallest? And what's going on here is in the realm of two-dimensional geometry, the circle is the most area efficient shape. So the closer you can push a shape towards being a circle, the kind of more geometrically perfect and the more area it's going to enclose. So a regular shape is what gets you towards that circular ideal. And that's why a square would have the largest area given a set perimeter. When debating between the rectangle and the parallelogram, remember area is always base times height. So the area of this parallelogram wouldn't be 15 times 5. It would be 15 times whatever this height metric right here would be, which you know cannot be more than 5. That must be a value smaller than 5 cutting through that shape. So it's not going to be as big as the area of rectangle C. So again, in the previous problem, a rectangle versus a square with the same perimeter, the square is always going to win out. And you can take a similar approach when you think about the number of sides a shape has. If you were to lock in the perimeter, then every time you're adding a side to that shape, you're getting it closer to that circular ideal. You know, by the time you get to a hundred sided shape, it's, it's almost imperceptibly different from a circle. So given a set perimeter, square beats the triangle, pentagon beats the square, hexagon beats the hexagon, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to the circle, which is the most efficient uh, way to put area inside of something. So let's look at just a couple more problems, and then we'll wrap up. So one last thing I want to talk about is the relationship of area to the other dimensions of a shape. So here's one about circles.
one of my favorite things to do in a circle problem is I'll just write R, D, C, and A on my paper representing radius, diameter, circumference, and area. Because as soon as you know one of those metrics, you can find the other three. And in this problem, we're given the area of circle X, 16 pi, area of Y is a single pi. So my radius then would be divided by pi and square rooted of that area. So just four diameters, double the radius, circumference is the diameter times pi. And same thing for y over here. Radius is 1, diameter 2, circumference 2 pi. And if we're comparing the circumference ratios, you can see that's a 4 to 1 ratio. But not only is that true for the circumference, you'll notice the radius and the diameter are also a 4 to 1 ratio. And it's that area proportion that's a little different, right? All those one-dimensional measurements, radius, diameter, circumference, things that are just lengths are four to one. But the area is 16 to one. And when it comes to similar shapes, like a smaller circle versus a bigger circle, or a smaller square versus a bigger square. This relationship is going to be maintained. That the ratio of the area, 16 to 1, that's the ratio of the one-dimensional measurements squared. Or in the opposite direction, if you square root the area ratio, you get the one-dimensional ratio. But again, this only works for similar shapes. So I can't apply this to a square versus a, an equilateral triangle, but two equilateral triangles, two similar trapezoids, anything that it's two shapes that are kind of similar to one another, this applies. So if we can push this to an extreme level, the last question today is what if we were looking at a shape that the GRE doesn't ask a whole lot about, you wouldn't be expected to compute the area of a shape like this manually. But using that rule we just discussed, you should be able to answer something like this regarding pentagons. Try it out.
So from the given information, you know, the one dimensional ratio is 32 to two, and that's going to reduce to 16 to one. So then if I want to compare the areas of these two shapes, it's going to be those metrics squared. So 16 to one, just square both of those and you get 256 to one. So choice E. Okay, and with that, we are gonna wrap up. So I like to end these sessions with some takeaways, which to me are kind of the most important nuggets of truth that you discover as you're studying. So take a moment, uh, if you're here live in the room or if you're watching this on YouTube later, try if you can without using your notes, just kind of crystallize some of the big ideas that we talked about and see if you can chat me, you know, like a one sentence piece of information that you're going to keep in mind as you continue your studies. And for me, some of the main points here, remember that area, you're multiplying two perpendicular one-dimensional values. That's how you create space and get area out of it. If you move to three dimensions, you're taking that face, which has area, and multiplying that by a depth to get three dimensions of volume. If you're looking at a weird shape and you're not sure what to do, try and cut it up into smaller triangular bits. And note that if two shapes have the set have a set perimeter, the more symmetrical you make that shape, the more you push it towards that circular ideal, the more area that's going to fit inside of it. And likewise, the more sides you add to a shape, the more area it's going to gain, as long as that perimeter is locked in. And that last thing we talked about, if you have similar shapes, the ratio of the areas is going to be the ratio of its one dimensional measurements squared. Or in the opposite direction, if you take the square root of the area ratio, you get the one dimensional ratios. All right, and that's going to do it for today. Uh, thanks to those of you who are able to join live in the room. If you are interested in attending any of these other prep hours in the future, I just put a link in the Zoom chat box that you can check out. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can manually type in that URL on your screen, or there should be some links live in the description as well. Uh, but yeah, it was fun hanging out with you all. And please join us again in the future. Uh, you're also welcome to try out session number one of our nine session course. We always welcome trial students to our first session of the course. So, you know, hope to see you at one of those or another prep hour in the future. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, but if you're in the room, you're welcome to stick around and ask any additional questions you might have.